Welcome to Wine Soundtrack USA. Listen to the passion with which producers narrate their winery and their world in 30 Answers. Discover their stories, personalities, and passions. Hello, friends of Wine Soundtrack. This is Allison Levine, and I'm sitting here in Napa Valley in a beautiful castle with Dario Satui. We're at Castello di Amoroso, and Dario, welcome, and tell us where we are and a little about it yourself. Thank you, Allison. Um, we're at Castel di Amorosa, as you said. It's um, a dream I had years ago. Uh, I got carried away with it. It started out a lot smaller. Uh, now it's about 145,000 square feet on eight, really nine levels, because we put in more caves on another level. Most of it's underground. Uh, we Probably 75% of it's underground. There's a 107 rooms. Every room different. It's all the ideas I saw in Europe over a period of years, primarily Italy, some France, a little Austria, Germany, but primarily Italy. And it's um, my version of a 14th century Tuscan castle, uh, given that there are modern building codes. I cheated a little bit where I could, but um, uh, the codes still dictate. Uh, in any event, we... Um, we have everything a 14th century castle would have had. We have five towers. We have uh, two courtyards. We have a deep well for water. We have stables. We have a uh, 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 torture chamber with prison, uh, an armaments room. Uh, we, we're sitting in the royal apartment. Uh, the royals would have lived upstairs, uh, partly for defense, and uh, would have made it more difficult to uh, get to them. Um, but throughout history, castles have always made wine, and some of the best wines made in Europe are made in castles. And so I thought, one, I had I love medieval architecture, I love architecture in general. Two, I wanted to honor my Italian heritage. But three, I thought it was only fitting that we were attempting and are attempting, and I think we've had some success making really great wines. And so I thought it's only fitting we do it in a castle setting. Plus, I love castles like any little kid my age. So, uh, so those are the reasons why we did that. We uh, I shipped in about 200 containers of uh, brick, um, old handmade brick, mostly out of Austria, also Italy, Romania. Uh, some stone, but most of the stone was quarried at two different quarries in Napa Valley. Um, what else? Oh, we, uh, all the doors and windows and all the light, everything is made by hand. This table is one piece of wood made by hand, uh, hand carved, all the design, the chair, everything. So every nail, uh, every light fixture, everything is made by hand. You can't fake something like this because people see it right away. You either do it right or 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 uh, people know. And so we tried to use the same tools you would have used in the Middle Ages. Yes, augmented by some power tools, by some lifts uh, to get up in the air. And uh, for instance, um, for all the grout, the, what goes between the stones and bricks, we used no cement because they didn't have cement in the Middle Ages. So we used lime, water, and sand. So we tried to do it really authentically and um, you know, we made a few mistakes, but we made those early on, and they're down in the cellar where it's hidden and dimly lit. And so, but we got better as we went along. I thought I'd do this for a career. I love it. And uh, I think overall it turned out pretty well. All I know is this. People responded to Castelli Amorosa. I think we're one of the two or three most visited wineries in the world after only 11 years, and they've responded to our wines. Um, we're, we're, uh, everything we make, we sell only direct from the castle. We're selling a lot of wine. I think we sell just about much or more wine than any wine we're selling direct in the world. <laughs> anyway, we're close. Well, question. Starting with Castello de Amoroso, what are the various grapes that you're, or wines you're producing here, and what's your total case production for this property? Um, currently, uh, we're making and selling about 55,000 cases a year, all direct out of here. Uh, we have probably 80 acres of grapes somewhere in there now. We're soon to have about 130. 
I just bought a third piece of property in Anderson Valley, 77 acres, and we'll get 40 to 50 acres, we think close to 50 uh, of grapes. Regarding your question regarding grapes, it's my idea since we sell direct to the consumer to have a wine at a price in a style for everybody who walks in the door. If somebody doesn't buy our wine, they didn't blow it, I blew it. Because I didn't have something of good enough quality at a price and a style they wanted. So we make a lot of different varieties. So we're t- a t- a primarily an Italian style winery. Um, we're making Pinot Grigio, Pinot Bianco, Vermentino. Uh, we're making Sangiovese, a rosé of Sangiovese. We call Gioia. Uh, we're making Muscato. Um, we're making a super Tuscan, a Cabernet Merlot blend with also with Sangiovese. Uh, I'm, I'm probably forgetting a few. We're, we're making an Il Pasito, it's, it's a late harvest wine uh, where we dry, let the grapes really dry out and hopefully get noble rot. But you could also say that's French as well because we're using Sauvignon Blanc and, uh, and uh, Sauvignon grapes. And we also make Chardonnay, Merlot, Cabernet. We're making some old vine Zinfandel. Um, so we're making quite a few varieties. Uh, we make a wine, I shouldn't say where I copied it from, it's really popular for us. We call it Fantasia. Uh, it's a wine, I copied a, a, a wine I saw in Italy. It had a name that was difficult for Americans to pronounce, so I call it La Fantasia. And it's a light, um, somewhat sweet wine. It has some effervescence. Uh, it's only about 6% alcohol. It's, it's, we had some last night on the port. It's just, you can, when you start sipping this, you can't put it down. It's, it's like a light red wine, uh, bubbly and just fruity and it's luscious. And um, in any case, we're, a lot of our wines sell very well. Um, you're also the proprietor of a rather famous winery here in Napa called Via Satui. Um, can you tell us just a little bit about that? And then I think you mentioned you have a few other properties. Sure. Um, my great-grandfather um, emigrated from Italy on his honeymoon in 1882. And he came around the uh, tip of South America in a four-mastered schooner. And his brother got so seasick, he got off the boat in, in um, Lima and founded a the Tui family there. Uh, my great grandfather and his wife Katarina came on the United uh, to San Francisco, settled in North Beach. Three years later, started a winery there, um, and then moved to the Mission District. Before the Mexicans moved in, the Mexicans probably don't realize it. It was basically German, Irish, and Italian, and. Um, they did really well. Uh, they ended up uh, selling in three states that I know of, Oregon, Washington, and California, and uh, were very successful. But then came, I think it was the 14th Amendment uh, Prohibition, and they were forced to close their doors. And so that was the end of the winery. But typical Italian, they lived upstairs from where they were. And a lot of Italians still do that today. And, and so even after the winery had gone defunct, they continued to live there, and they actually leased it out to another winery called Montebello, which went out of business in 1965. So as a kid, my first memories, uh, we'd go visit our relatives often. Um, they lived upstairs, as I said. They'd open the door with a buzzer, and it reeked of wine. <laughs> so uh, those are kind of my first memories. And then I played among the barrels downstairs. They had full cellars downstairs, and... Um, and I saw photographs, they related the stories to me. So as a kid, even at 10, 12, I felt fairly committed and inspired to reinitiate the family winery. And then I went to school, traveled in Europe, did other things. And when I came back from Europe in 19, I can't remember, 72, 73, um, I decided one, I needed a job. I didn't have a job. And two, I was going to do what I always wanted to do, which was restart the family winery. But I didn't have any money. I had uh, $5,000, and my mother gave me three more, so I had eight. And I didn't know anything about wine. I was living out of my van trying to save money. I promised I was engaged 
to a girl from Finland. I promised her a better life, and we're living in a van, right? <laughs> she wanted to go back to her mother, I think. Um, in any event, um, but somehow I was able to do it. A lot of hard work, and and um, I didn't even realize Davis, the University of California, Davis were saying when I was trying to start. You couldn't start a small winery for less than a million dollars. I didn't know that. I didn't see the research fortune, but I would have been scared to death. I thought I would have needed a hundred thousand. Never even got that. I you got proved six, eight thousand. Uh, huh? You proved them that eight thousand worked. Well, well, I did get total capital sixty-two five. I was trying to get a hundred <laughs> and two sixty-two five. And we, um, but we went without everything. I couldn't even afford a cash register. I had a little wooden, a little wooden box, a little smaller than that for making change, uh, planks for shelves over barrels. I had an old hand crank, a uh, crank uh, adding machine my great grandfather used for uh, doing the books. I, you know, I measured the county, so I did a little bit of everything. But in any case, and uh, we actually made a, a tiny, tiny profit our first year. Oh, and fun, and we kept growing and growing. So Vista Tui Winery, um, making really good wines. Um, they, um, they are also one of the top three visited wineries in the world. So I have two of them. And uh, and uh, I and think you must it, be doing something right. Yeah, something right. I hope. You know, I think it's a, a lot of it's how much you care. I, you know, I, I, all my life, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it the best I possibly can. I know. I, I won't reach perfection, but if you set your goals high, um, maybe you'll get close. And so I've always, I've, I've always tried to take the long run, and make a quality product the best you can, uh, sell it at a fair price. And if you do that, people respond to that and give the best possible customer service you possibly can. And because what I am gratified is when people buy our wines, go away for a smile, and then come back and tell their friend. Word of mouth is the best thing you can have. Anyways, Visa Tui actually sells more wine than here, about 65,000 cases a year, all direct. We have a great deli with an Italian chef and seven more cooks, seven days a week making uh, food uh, for our deli. So most of what we have is not factory food. It's homemade using the best ingredients. We have a Michelin chef, and I'll bet you there's no other Michelin chef in the United States. He does our events and our our weddings, and then we have about two acres of picnic grounds, and uh, and it's very well attended and very well received, and I'm very pleased with both of them. Great information. I'm curious. Um, do you think? Well, for Visa Tui, what what varieties do you focus on there? Is it also Italian? Uh, we we make some Italian. We're trying to keep from making the same varieties, and certainly we're keeping from making the same varieties from the same vineyards, but. We both, you know, we're kind of competitors, although I own them both. <laughs> but um, but we both make Chardonnay, we both make um, Cabernet, Merlot, but they make a Sauvignon Blanc, we don't. Um, they make some wines that we we don't. They make a dry Muscat, Muscata, for instance. Um, they're making some different wines than we are. And um, I like it that way. Do you remember the very first memorable wine you ever drank? I do remember in 1972, I believe it was, where I just come back from Europe. I was working at a wine store, Connoisseur Wine Imports. It's no longer a business. And the owner was very wealthy. And he had a birthday party. And he put out all these 1941 Bordeaux. I don't remember all the names, but I, I was so fortunate to get to drink. That was a great year in Bordeaux all these great Bordeaux, and he also had some great burgundies out. <clears throat> so I don't remember the exact names, but I remember that occasion, some very good ones. Do you think that there's a such thing as a perfect variety? I, you know, I, I like different wines for different occasions with different foods. Probably my favorite overall would be Cabernet Sauvignon. It's more flavorful, more complex. But I, you know, I, I drink all kinds of different wines. Um, I would assume that you have a large cellar of wines. Probably at least 3,000 bottles. <laughs> and what is the most expensive wine in your cellar? Um, well, I do have a few Bordeaux, like uh, Lafitte, uh, Margot, uh, but I mainly I drink my own wines, and uh, th- those being from Satui, uh, from, uh, 
from the castle, but I also trade. So I have some Raymond, I have some Caymus, I have the Chateau Monolina, some Fardiente, and sometimes I get gifts and so forth. So I, I drink other people's wines, but I tend to drink my own the most. And of the wines in your cellar, what's giving you the most satisfaction to drink right now? Well, right now, um, you know, it's really hot. Uh, I don't know when this is going to go on the air, but it's about 95 degrees today. And uh, we're drinking lighter wines. Uh, we have red meat, Pinot Noir, or Rosé, uh, or uh, um, I'm drinking um, Vermentino, Pinot Bianco, Pinot Grigio, even Chardonnay right now is too heavy for me with the heat. So, or, um, or sometimes an old vine Zinfandel. If somebody doesn't drink wine, which is a shame, we know, what do you think they're losing out by not drinking your wine? We've found that um, we've attracted entry-level drinkers by offering some wines, both at Visa Tui and at the Castle, that are fruity, a little bit sweet, a little lighter in alcohol, easier to quaff. And, and, and we've seen... You know, Satui's been in business about 41 to 42 years now. We've seen how people evolve. Many of our customers started out on our Gamay Rouge, which was a a little bit of a sweet rosé, real fruity, and now they're in Cabernet. So they've evolved and edified their taste over the years from lighter, uh, whiter rosé wines to the more complex reds. So you can turn any non-drinker into a drinker. I, and I think um, often if we can get a non-drinker to try, for instance, our La Fantasia here, uh, or maybe our Dolcino Gewurz demeanor, that gets them started in, uh, on the road to corruption. <laughs> <laughs> As um, you know, they say that every vintage tells a different story. I don't know if you agree with that or not. But if that is every the case, every vintage is different, and it's every vintage. You know, you think you know everything, and then uh, you know, last year was a fire. Uh, yeah, before that, the drought. Uh, uh, you know, whatever, you, whatever you think you know, is, uh, is there'll be something different every vintage. Do you think that there are some things that repeat themselves? Probably in general, yes. Uh, you know, some years we have rain during the harvest. Some years we have a heat spike. Uh, some years we have drought. Um, yeah, I, I would say in general, yes. But I don't think any two vin- vintages are exactly alike. Do you have any um, omens you look for or predictors to see what a harvest is going to be like? Do I have any what? Any signs or omens you look for? No. No superstition. Okay. <laughs> what is your general opinion of wine critics and scores? Oh boy, who's this? Who's this going to go out to? <laughs> I, I tend to be too honest. I get myself in trouble. Um, I think for those that aren't um, confident enough, confident enough in their own uh, taste, uh, if they don't. Th- think they know enough about wine, they tend to rely on critics. And uh, I think, I'm sure there are many really good, solid critics that really know their wine and try to be objective. But I also think, I'm trying to finesse this a little bit like a politician, I also think that you should rely on your own taste. Sure, read what the critics say, maybe try what they think is good. But rely on your own taste because just because a, a critic may like a certain style of wine and it may not be your style of wine, even if you're an aficionado or that you really know and enjoy wine and have a lot of experience with it, you may not like what he or she likes. So I, I sure, uh, read, do the research and then rely on your own taste. Okay. Um, some people read tea leaves to see at the bottom of a cup what the future will hold. If you could read the bottom of a red wine glass, what would you want it to tell you? Um, where's the bottle so I can pour a little more? <laughs> <laughs> when you were little, what did you want to be when you grew up? Um, I wanted to revive Visa Tui Winery. Even from a young child? Since I was 10 or so. That's fantastic, and you've brought that dream to life. When you're working, when you're not working, how do you spend your free time? What do you do? Uh, well, my fiance Irina is a really good cook, 
So we usually eat at home, even though we have a plethora of really great restaurants in Napa Valley. We normally eat at home. Uh, we have friends over. Um, I'm spent, you know, I'm I'm semi-retired now, and I'm spending about four months a year in Europe. Uh, we go twice a year, to, uh, more uh, longer in the spring. <clears throat> I, I, I just bought a chateau in France a year and a half ago. I bought the monastery outside of Siena in Italy. Uh, about 26 years ago. Uh, I, I, I'm a sucker for architecture. I also bought a Medici Palace. That's where we make the Vin Santo. Uh, you know, I, I, it's a disease and I can't cure myself. <laughs> and I, 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 I may buy something else I'm looking at right now. But So it's, it's a real problem for me. Um, in any case, uh, so I, I love Europe and, um, and, and we take trips around here too. And, um, and we also visit friends. We go to the Bay Area and so forth. So, uh, and we like music. Uh, right now, we're involved in Festival Napa Valley. I'm on the board of directors. It's a classical music festival with some of the greatest artists in the world. Uh, in fact, tonight and tomorrow night, uh, there's uh, two performances here. Thank you. You're welcome to stay if you want. To. I believe I'm going to oh, be okay, staying. You're right. <laughs> And I like sports. I like Cal football, too. Cal football. <laughs> I was going to ask you if you like sports. Yeah. If uh, your team were to win, what bottle of wine would you give them to celebrate? Well, they usually don't win because they're an <laughs> academic school. <laughs> but I would probably open a bottle of one of our sparkling wines. Uh, we make also uh, Method Champenois uh, sparkling wine. And it's, to my taste, it's really good. Oh, I hope to try that. Yeah. Um, for a romantic evening with your wife, I know you say that you eat at home a lot. Fiance, she has fiance. Asked me, yeah. Oh, <laughs> for your with your fiance, uh, what what wine would you order? Well, I mean, she's the boss, so I usually uh, <laughs> I order what she likes. Um, it'd be a red wine for sure. She prefers red over white, and probably a Cabernet or a Cabernet blend wine. Yeah, she likes. Full-bodied, complex, flavorful wines, and and she's has got a pretty, you know, she's from Russia, but she measured in in um, in fermentation science at Moscow State, the best <laughs> university of Russia, and then she never used it. Now she's uh, almost married to a, a wine guy. <laughs> And if you guys are cooking at home, do you follow the rules, or have you broken the rules and done red wine with fish? And no, I, I would never have red wine with fish. But, uh, and certainly, I would never have a heavy red wine with fish. I know some, some of my friends do it, and they know wine. I think it's horrible. I um, I could have a Pinot Noir with fish. I could have a, maybe a real light red wine with fish, but I almost always have white wine with fish or with uh, salmon because it's so rich, I like the Chardonnay with the salmon. Uh, my fiance often makes uh, uh, spaghetti con vongole, spaghetti and clams, and uh, so we'll have a Pinot Grigio, Pinot Bianco, Vermentino with that. You know, I want something high acid to go with that, or usually with seafood as well. But, and, you know, with um, duck, uh, wild game, uh, meat course, uh, I'll, I'll have a, a full-bodied red with pork, I might have a Pinot Noir, or I might have, I could even go white wine, but probably a Chardonnay, but normally I'd have a red even with pork. You know. <laughs> what is the best piece of advice someone ever gave you? I'll paraphrase my mother. She, she basically, she gave me a lot of independence. She just said, go do it. And when I was 10 years old, you won't believe this, we live in Fairfax, 24 miles from San Francisco, she let me go on the bus by myself to the city. And basically, she um, didn't overmother me. She gave me a lot of independence. And she just said, don't let obstacles get in your way. Just fulfill your dreams. Go after it. Do it. And, um, and that's my philosophy. I, I think anybody can, or most anybody, can achieve their goals, their dreams, if they're willing to pay the price, if they're willing to work hard, if they're just willing to stay with it. I mean, when I first started the winery, I mean, I couldn't get it together. I couldn't get the financing. I, I, you know, I, we were really hurting. I was, um, you know, I, I had no furniture. I lived in one room. That was after I got out of the 
the van. And um, <laughs> but I, you know, I, I just wouldn't give up. And and I, and it's not that I'm bright. I just I wouldn't give up. And I just kept going and going. And anyway, I think my mother instilled that in me, and um, I'm very grateful to her for that. I would think that's some advice that we could take for ourselves, too, to work really hard. And I think it, uh, most anybody can attain whatever they want. You know, given some natural ability, if you have no ability in math, don't become a math teacher, right? <laughs> right. But, but if you have some ability in something and you really want it, go after it. Follow your dreams. Follow your passion. Don't do things for money. I'm, you know, I hope I'm not lying. I'm trying to be honest with myself. I don't believe I've ever done anything primarily for money. I like money. But I've never, I don't think, done anything primarily for money. I wouldn't do it. I, you know, I want to do something I love. Then you'll do a better job if you do something you love. And the money will probably come even more rapidly because you're doing something you love and you're putting everything you have into it. So that's been my philosophy. Absolutely. What would you say your proudest achievement is? Um, <laughs> well, probably I'm most proud of... of reviving Visa Tui Winery. And um, all of my relatives wanted that to happen. And my father, you know, his name was Satui, wanted it to happen. And so I'll, to honor him and to honor our family heritage, I was really proud and continue to be proud of that. If you were, um, if you were walking by a restaurant and you saw someone famous sitting at a table, the paparazzi catches it. They start taking photos, and that person has a bottle of your wine on the table. Which celebrity would you want it to be, from any walk of life? Uh, probably a good-looking woman, but uh, <laughs> 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 no, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Somebody, uh, somebody personable, somebody fun, somebody uh, that uh, he wouldn't mind me coming up to, or he or she wouldn't mind me coming up to and engaging a little bit in conversation, but. You know, the name of person, I don't know. Well, you say that you're living in Italy and you're living in France, so I don't know. Are there any other winemaking regions you still want to explore? Um, at this point, no. Um, <laughs> four is enough. But, um, you know, who knows? Uh, you know, I have some other ideas, but, uh, you know, I don't like to talk until I do it. So, so um, you know, I know I'm getting older, but I, I'm just full of ideas and, and still have quite a bit of energy, and so I'm going to go down kicking and hopefully not for a long time. Do you think that people will still be drinking wine in 2,000 years' time? I hope so. I mean, we've been drinking wine for 5,000 years, and so I, I, uh, wine is a very social, convivial. It uh, gives a lot of pleasure. It enhances the flavor of food. The food, in turn, enhances the flavors of the wine. Um, it's it's a, it's a real social thing, and um, and uh, yeah, absolutely, I think people will be doing that. You know, me, I I don't sip wine usually. Like last night was a really warm night, so we had the fantasia on the porch without food. But I normally don't do that. I usually drink wine only when I eat, uh, and uh, and then when I finish eating, I stop drinking the wine. My fiance will have another glass or so after that. <laughs> Well, before we finish this, there's one more game that we well, play. An exception now, though. <laughs> yes, we're sipping wine right now. <laughs> uh, one uh, game we play just before we end this um, at Wine Soundtrack is that we like to talk about music and wine. I know you said you're a music fan. So we're sitting here drinking a beautiful rosé of Pinot Noir. What uh, song does it conjure up, or what would you like to be listening to right now as we drink this? Rimsky Korsakov. He, he, uh, a Russian composer of such... Um, passionate music. Uh, I, I love listening to him. Um, uh, what's the Italian composer? Uh, Rossini, uh, especially his overtures. Uh, I love his overtures. Uh, he teases you. He, uh, he plays with you, and, 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 and you know he brings you to a low, and then he. Uh, no, 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 there'd be a good metaphor, but I can't say it on the air. So, uh, <laughs> but you can guess. What about Cabernet Sauvignon? Well, yeah, Cabernet is a really complex wine. See, again, yeah, I would have that during during a meal. I wouldn't be sipping it. So, well, while you're eating and drinking the wine, what music's playing in the background? A, what I like to listen to when I'm not listening to classical music, there's a station we discovered 
in Italy, but it's from New York City. It's called uh, Radio Italy, not Italia, Radio Italy Live New York. And they play all the great Italian music. And uh, and without commercials, 24 hours a day. I don't know how they haven't gone broke. They've been doing it for about four years. Anyway, so I would enjoy a glass of Cabernet with my food, <laughs> listening to some of the great Italian music. And uh, I, I enjoy Bocelli a lot. I actually saw him in Rome a couple of years ago. Uh, I enjoy some of the opera singers. But I, I love passionate classical music. Fantastic. Dario, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, before we leave, just a reminder for Via Satui, um, where can they find where can they find it? What's the website? Okay. Um, the website Visatui, V-S-A-T-T-U-I. And Visatui is on the main road uh, coming up from Napa, Highway 29. And it's uh, about two miles south of St. Helena, it's on the right side as you approach St. Helena. There's a big picnic area out in front. Uh, you'll see a, a stucco building, which is our tasting room in Delhi. And then to the rear, a stone, uh, I like to think a beautiful stone building that I built in 1983. And, um, and we have a lot going on there. Uh, we have uh, uh, different tasting rooms. Uh, we're family friendly. We're kid friendly. Uh, you can ride your bicycle there. We're dog friendly, um, and uh, and we have great. F- you know, I grew up uh, in an Italian family, and we often had uh, picnics and barbecues outdoors, where we all got together. And so I basically brought my childhood experience to Visa Tui in that we're attempting to make really good wines and in a setting where you can be with family and friends and enjoy them with the food we make in our own kitchen. So that's, I brought what I grew up with. That's fantastic. So families, fun, really good food, wine, that's Visa Tui. And then the Castello di Amoroso is up near Calistoga. And um, how can people find it um, and the website? Okay, uh, all you have to do is go to Castello di Amorosa, C-A-S-T-E-L-L-O-D-I-A-M-O-R-O-S-A. And those are three words, Castello di Amorosa. And I have to say that you, you're great with people. You're, um, you, you just have a way with people. You got me. You got me. Thank you know, you. You've been real severe. You know, I might have clammed down a little bit. But <laughs> well, fantastic. It's definitely worth coming to either of the places for the experience, just the feeling about it. It's just a really good energy. It's more than just tasting wine. It's an experience. And I thank you for having me here today. And thank you for joining us on Wine Sign Track. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks for listening to a new episode of Wine Soundtrack USA. For details and updates, visit our website, winesoundtrack.com.